Hello, welcome to my presentation on subcultures. Uh, since I'm awful at doing live presentations, I'm going to do a video. So, what are subcultures? Subcultures are smaller cultures within broader society who have their own values, practices, and belief systems which are much of the time in conflict with the ruling hegemony. There are many theories about subcultures and how they came to be in our utopian society of income equality and opportunity. Who are these deviants and why can't they just wear normal pants like everyone else? Many subculture theorists seem to blame young working class white kids for disrupting society by getting together and forming deviant mobs when they can't get ahead in society. Robert Merton's position was that when mainstream goals such as obtaining a nice house and car put pressure on an individual to conform, the individual either adapts to the structure society has produced or joins a deviant subculture to achieve those things in ways not acceptable to broader society. He calls this strain theory. He says that humans are inherently good, but societal pressures to achieve wealth cause strain and stress, making us deviate from pro-social behavior. Albert Cohen's gig was sort of similar to Merton's in ways. He also pointed to a type of strain. He said that working class youth cannot achieve mainstream goals by legitimate means due to being culturally deprived and that they experience strain as status frustration. So these guys, and I say guys because most of these academic dudes only mention young boys in the studies I've read. So these young people, according to Cohen, reject middle class values and form subcultures of like-minded people in their same position. They form an alternative status hierarchy where they gain status through delinquent action. So trying to gain the respect of their peers by vandalizing buildings, getting in brawls, being disorderly, etc. Uh, not for financial gain, as Merton suggests. And then Walter B. Miller comes along and he's like, no, nah, you guys are full of BS. Deviant behavior is not a result of failure to reach mainstream goals. Actually, they never share these goals. Instead, lower class youth have their own set of values called focal concerns which consist of these six deviant subcultural values predisposed to poor white kids. Trouble, autonomy, toughness, fatalism, smartness, and excitement. But there is much, much more to this, but I have to move on. Uh, I actually spent most of the time checking out Dick Hedbidge's take on subcultures because it was much more interesting to me. His study of punks, mods, glam rockers, bowieites, and various other subcultures also looks at deviance and delinquency, but also examines how subcultures appropriate objects and language from mass culture and give it new meaning. This repurposing of signs is threatening to the mainstream's understanding of common objects and language. This gives things multiple identities which stuffs up the dominant culture's, the hegemony's, efforts to control general discourse. Hedbidge uses the early punks as an example of the complex relationship between dominant culture and subculture. He explains that perverse and radical styles incite a cultural fear of further hidden transgressions. As the discussion spreads, these fearful imaginings are assumed to be true. The idea of the violent punk is then bolstered and becomes sensationalized by the media, painting the subculture as a social menace. So if one punk rocker takes a dump on the bonnet of a car, that behavior is seen as representative of the entire subculture. The punk aesthetic becomes bound with an aura of fear. This is called moral panic. As the mainstream continues to put this subculture on exhibition, the strange becomes familiar. The phenomena is defined and categorized. The fear becomes tolerance and then apathy. The subculture is rehabilitated and prepared for assimilation into the mainstream where the next step is commodification. The now popular and positive image of the punk undercuts the punker narrative of alienation and disenfranchisement, therefore weakening the subculture's credibility. Hedbidge says that style is inherently subversive, suggesting most fashion trends are rooted in subculture. He gives the example of the safety pin, a common household object used to fasten nappies back before parents began trashing the environment with disposable ones. The early punks adopted the safety pin and used it as jewelry, body piercings, and to adorn their clothing. This was shocking to many at first, but eventually the mainstream shock wears off and it starts becoming fashionable as adornment for the mainstream as well. It becomes commodified. The safety pin is just one example. Think about work boots, gold chains, athletic gear, trench coats. How about trucker hats? These are the lidded caps worn by people who drive trucks for a living. These hats usually have the name of the trucking company they work for or some item or emblem associated with their occupation. So the 90s edition hipster, always on the hunt for a dose of irony, begins finding these hats at thrift stores and soon it becomes a challenge as to who can find the most authentic working class hat. It becomes a way to obtain status among fellow hipsters. Then mass culture catches wind of all these kids who are not truck drivers rocking these old man caps. Slowly the trucker hat gets absorbed into the mainstream, where it becomes high fashion, 
and is even adopted by other subcultures until it reaches the pinnacle of appropriation. And then it starts eating itself again. So the cycle continues with subcultures and their icons and objects. You can see it with Normcore, a movement that was born out of resistance to showy forms of individuality. It began as an attitude of anti-style. Members adopt frumpy, plain-looking clothing from the mainstream in order to make an anti-fashion statement. But just like other subcultures, mass culture becomes aware of it, and it is eventually reabsorbed into the mainstream, and then it becomes commodified and watered down. My rebuttal with what I've learned about this subject is probably pointed at Merton and Cohen's theory of strain and status frustration. I don't really believe that you have to be young and poor to want to challenge mainstream values and that you can assign all of these factors to an individual to explain why he or she wants to deviate from the norm. According to some of these theories, the fact that I spent a good chunk of my childhood living in a shitty apartment in a bad neighborhood, well, this should have put me on the career path to crime, but it didn't. So anyway, here are my questions. Um, are there any subcultures that have stayed underground and avoided commodification that you know of? Are you wearing anything that has origins in a deviant subculture? Are you disappointed when something you love becomes mainstream? And is there anything else you want to discuss? Thanks for staying awake through my presentation, and have a day.